Welcome to Breaking the Set. I'm Abby Martin. Many countries think of health care as a privilege, not a right, and only those who can afford it deserve it. But countries like Cuba have taken a radically different approach. And today we'll be looking at how a small island nation has managed to ensure universal health care for its 11 million citizens, as well as be on the front lines of nearly every major natural disaster. So stay tuned as we examine what it means to focus on disease prevention and how a society is impacted by investing in health care as a human right instead of just another profit-making industry. Now let's break the set. Cuba's system of free preventative health care for its citizens has put the country on par with most of the developed world. However, the crippling embargo prevents access to crucial medicine. And as we walked around one health clinic in Havana, the disrepair and out-of-date medical equipment was palpable, making it all the more surprising that according to the CIA World Factbook, Cuba has a lower infant mortality rate than the U.S. and a comparable life expectancy of about 78 to 79 years old. Director General of the World Health Organization, Margaret Chan, has even said, Cuba gave the world a model for transforming health systems toward the noble ideals of equity and social justice. Cuba has pioneered and modernized the concept of medical cooperation. In an HWO report, she further writes that if a resource-lacking country like Cuba could take such a bold initiative, the health void left by other countries exposes their lack of political will to protect their most vulnerable citizens. Cuba spends 10% of its GDP on the state-run health system, as opposed to America's nearly 18%. But for all the money being thrown at the sick here in America, we're no healthier. And it's largely due to the emphasis on treating disease instead of preventing it. Sex education is not only promoted in Cuba, but contraceptives are free or nearly free. Birth defect screening is mandatory, and there are even screening programs for children's hearing because auditory problems are correlated with mental health. There's about one doctor for every 170 patients, and usually doctors and nurses are present in almost every neighborhood. Many times they live directly next to their offices so they can monitor the community in real time and take account of social and environmental factors in their care. But doctors only get paid on average up to $70 a month, far less than many other jobs in Cuba. So where is the incentive to become one of 75,000 doctors that make up Cuba's population? Well, we had the opportunity to speak with one doctor at a neighborhood primary care clinic to get some answers. What made you want to become a doctor? It was for humanitarian reasons, because I like to help people. I like to solve people's health problems, and I believe it is work that deserves respect, consideration, and everyone inside themselves has a doctor. Everyone likes to help others and have good health. These are principal elements. How has the U.S. embargo affected the medical community here and also access to medicine? Generally, the worst impact is access to medicines that are produced in the United States that we don't have in this country. They're for specific procedures to treat illnesses like leukemia, so we cannot give adequate treatment to patients. How does medical access compare in cities to rural areas? We have basic health teams that are distributed throughout the area that the polyclinic covers. They can give basic health attention to patients in their homes. If a patient needs other attention, a family doctor gives a remittance to the polyclinic or to the secondary level of health, which are hospitals, or to the third level of the health care system, which are institutes. It means that the people who live in the city, as well as those people who live in the countryside, receive the same attention. There's no difference. And why does Cuba integrate a preventative health care model? Because you can guarantee a better way of life for patients. You can detect illnesses in early stages, for example, hypertension, diabetes, endocrine illnesses, and cancer, and you can guarantee a better quality of life for patients. Katiel, why do you and other doctors disagree with the for-profit health care model? 
Everybody can be sick at any moment, so it's not fair that you have to pay for that service. Ideally, everyone is considered the same, and this is the path we have chosen, which is the most adequate. And as a doctor, do you feel like you get adequately paid? The payment I receive is enough for me and my family. I don't have any complaints about it. Katiel, what do you think the biggest challenges are facing Cuba's healthcare system right now? The biggest challenge is guaranteeing the quality of life of patients, to guarantee that all people live 70 years or more, and make sure that every Cuban medical service achieves excellency. While Cuba's health care system has led to a high life expectancy rate domestically, the country's most impressive medical success can be seen abroad. And one of the primary ways this internationalist approach to health care has been expressed is through the Latin American School of Medicine, where students from all over the world come to study. In order to get a sense of what makes this school so unique, we spoke to several students attending the institution about why they would leave their respective countries to attend medical school in Cuba. Breaking the set, producer Cody Snell has the report. $1.16 trillion. That's the collective amount of money Americans owe creditors for outstanding student loans. And perhaps no group is feeling the crushing weight of this debt more than young doctors. According to the Association of American Medical Colleges, the average debt for med school graduates is over $176,000. As a result, prospective doctors are turning to the unlikeliest of places for their medical education, the Latin American School of Medicine in Havana, known as ELAM in Spanish. UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon has called ELAM the most advanced medical school in the world. And it's no wonder, considering that the institute has graduated 20,000 doctors in over 120 countries. But perhaps the most surprising aspect of this school is that for thousands of students, their tuition is entirely paid for by the Cuban government at an estimated cost of ten dollars to $15,000 a year per student. Preference is given to low-income scholars in the hopes that they will be empowered to return to their countries and serve their neediest local communities. And yes, that even includes American students. The reason why I, was, I wasn't so sure I'm going to a medical school in the U.S. because the huge amount of loans that uh, a student has to take out and that kind of shackles a person to the medical system. For Pennsylvania resident Jessica Mansbach, the decision to come to Cuba went far beyond just avoiding a crippling financial burden. I think many of us have had the experience in the U.S. healthcare system that equipment and intervention and diagnostics is useful when it's needed but it's overused in the states. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a lack of preventative care. And according to the students we talked to, it's this preventative holistic model that is emphasized from day one at Elon. Throughout their time at the school, students are sent to 14 urban and rural areas throughout Cuba, where they learn to consider the societal and cultural factors that contribute to a patient's health. A, a patient's willingness and effort to, to follow the doctor's plan, which is supposedly what's going to make them well, the, the primary and most dominant factor in that is pa the patient's view of the doctor. And that view of the doctor has a lot to do with how well that doctor knows how to really relate to a person as a person. Yeah, I wish I could, I could bring this uh, new view of medicine to, in my country, first of all, and then to see how I can uh, stimulate my government to, to try to see another way. So considering that these students are expected to return to their home countries after graduation, what exactly is in it for Cuba? Well, cynics maintain that it's merely a beneficial public relations program for the Castro government. But Dr. Heidi Soka Gonzalez, the vice academic dean of ELAM, says that the school is just the latest example of Cuba's internationalist approach to health. Cuba has been a country that has received expressions of solidarity from many countries around the world. And for Cuba, one form of responding to this solidarity has been giving our medical help to countries most in need. Of course, the school is not without its flaws, as access to expensive medical technology, up-to-date textbooks, and adequate living expenses are extremely difficult 
difficult to come by due to both the blockade and government restrictions. Cuba has the innovation and they've, they just haven't had the resources. Um, one of the things that the medical community suffers from is just lack, or probably all the current communities, is lack of information because of the blockade and the lack of access, internet access, telecommunication access. For us, mainly here in the school, most of the students from Africa, we have a lot of problems to receive our stipends from our government because they normally from, Af from Central Africa, money should pass through f uh, f uh, Europe before reaching here. But despite these limitations, every year Elam continues to produce thousands of doctors that probably never would have existed for a world that desperately needs them. Cuba is offering me the chance to be a free man to go back to my country and to provide for people who, who are uh, inadequately treated or you know, who don't have the opportunity to have a good doctor that really cares about them. In Havana, Cuba, for Breaking the Set, this is Cody Snow. While the media has all but forgotten about the continuing Ebola crisis in West Africa that has killed over 9,500 people, one nation has been on the front lines fighting the epidemic long before the rest of the international community stepped in. Despite a population of just over 11 million people and a per capita income of about $6,000, Cuba managed to send the world's largest contingent of medical professionals to Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea. Over the past few months, more than 460 Cubans have traveled to West Africa to assist those suffering from the disease. And the response is just the latest example of Cuba's philosophy of medical solidarity. In fact, more than 50,000 Cuban healthcare workers are currently operating in a stunning 66 countries around the world. So in order to find out just how Cuba managed to send so many doctors and nurses to these crises zones, we met with Dr. Regla Angulo Pardo, director of the Central Unit of Medical Cooperation, which coordinates the Cuban response to epidemics like Ebola. In Africa specifically, we've been giving our aid solidarity since 1963. And when the Ebola crisis hit, we already had the presence of 32 Cuban medical brigades across Africa, including the three countries that were hardest hit by the epidemic, Liberia, Guinea and Sierra Leone. Over the years, Cuba has managed to create its own state-sponsored Doctors Without Borders type program, in which recent medical school graduates are given the opportunity to serve one to two year missions abroad before returning home. According to Gail Reed, the co-founder of Medical Education Cooperation with Cuba, this is something built into the psyche of Cuban doctors and nurses. The idea that I'm a public servant it's coming from a commitment to make health care a universally accepted right. And when outbreaks like Ebola start to emerge, the country not only trains doctors in how to respond to specific diseases, but also how to deal with cultural and societal differences, such as West African burial practices. The incentive to work in these countries is quite high, given that the average Cuban doctor earns a mere $70 per month. Whereas Cubans that have been sent to West Africa to work with the World Health Organization earn about $250 a day from the WHO. Unfortunately, many doctors are prevented from receiving their salaries on time due to the embargo. See, because of Cuban banking restrictions, payments to doctors in West Africa from the WHO were delayed for months until the agency could get special licenses from the U.S. Treasury Department to transfer money to doctors in Africa. Nonetheless, it's this medical solidarity that has become a cornerstone of Cuban diplomacy and the primary way in which the country attempts to combat the isolation that's been forced upon it for so many years. I believe that Ebola has brought the world together in a general effort to stop this epidemic from expanding to other countries. I believe it was proven in Liberia that in terms of public health, in the field of humanism and solidarity, the Cuban medical brigades and our Cuban doctors can work with any other medical personnel from anywhere in the world, including the United States. I believe the world has been united in working through the joint efforts of the World Health Organization, the Pan American Health Organization and even the UN, everyone working together to stop this outbreak. 
It's quite sad that horrific epidemics like Ebola are one of the only ways to bring together historic enemies. But this cooperation proves that countries can set aside their differences for the sake of our collective humanity. Coming up, I'll sit down with Cuban President Raul Castro's daughter. Stay tuned. I'm a fighter. I can take a punch. I live. I learn something every day. I strike when I need to strike. I prepare. I've earned everything I have. If I fall, I get back up. I won't be underestimated. I'm Aaron Aid, and I put the boom into Boom Bus. You know that guy who wishes someone would spy on him? How about the woman who enjoys being lied to by her government? This citizen can't get enough congressional inaction, and this taxpayer wants the mainstream media to be more corporatized. While this person would rather eat genetically modified food, this one thinks our prisons are not crowded enough. And what do these people have in common? They don't exist. Doctors are known as Cuba's most valuable export commodity. But despite a global demonization campaign against the country, its medical advancements are pretty hard to ignore. In fact, Secretary of State John Kerry even admitted he was impressed by Cuba's response to the Ebola epidemic. But it wasn't the first time this small nation has stepped up to the plate in the wake of humanitarian crises. After the Chernobyl nuclear meltdown in 1986, Cuba took in thousands of victims of the disaster to treat in a special center near Havana. The Guardian also notes in the aftermath of the Kashmir earthquake of 2005, Cuba sent 2,400 medical workers to Pakistan and treated more than 70% of those affected. They also left behind 32 field hospitals and donated 1,000 medical scholarships. Furthermore, after the devastating 2010 Haiti earthquake, Cuba sent the largest contingent of doctors and treated 40% of the victims. Doctors trained in Cuba have also performed a whopping 3 million free eye surgeries across the world, even for the man who killed Che Guevara. And while many of these missions are altruistic in nature, it's important to note that the Cuban government leases out doctors as well, earning as much as $8 billion a year from these types of programs, including an oil for doctors program for Venezuela. But with its medical internationalism gaining global notoriety and shaming America's all-military approach to global crises, the U.S. government has created a way to undermine the country's advancements while at the same time draining its finances. In 2006, George W. Bush started the Cuban Medical Professional Parole Program, an initiative designed to coax doctors into defecting to the U.S. Similar to the Cuban Adjustment Act, this program provides a special fast track to U.S. citizenship that no other immigrant enjoys. And according to the New York Times, over 1,000 Cuban doctors took advantage of the program in 2013. But unfortunately, the promise of being able to practice their well-paid profession here in America is easier said than done. Currently, there are thousands of overqualified Cuban doctors across the U.S. that have been delegated to working in restaurants or other odd jobs totally unrelated to their profession due to extremely strict testing requirements to get their licenses validated. So at this point, you may be wondering why the U.S. government is disrupting a program designed to provide crucial medicine to those most in need. 
Don't worry, though. The State Department claims it's not meant to subvert medical missions around the world, but simply to help Cubans become U.S. citizens who may not otherwise be able to. The man behind the bill, Emilio Gonzalez, is an anti-Castro exile who maintains that Cuban doctors have no say in assignments and get paid slave wages while on the missions. And while there have been concerns about government corruption when it comes to allotting payment to doctors, Cuban doctors who have been interviewed by the Wall Street Journal say that while serving overseas, they get their Cuban salaries plus a $50 per month stipend, both paid to their dependents while they're abroad. In addition, they earn overseas salaries from $150 to $1,000 a month, depending on the mission. Now, Cuba has pleaded for Washington to stop encouraging doctors to defect through this program, but the U.S. government has refused. And with climate change tripling the number of natural disasters over the last 40 years alone, it's more crucial than ever for the U.S. to cooperate with Cuba and end its subversive tactics against a country leading the health care efforts for the world's poor. Instead of actively undermining Cuba's exemplary medical achievements, the U.S. government should be emulating them. You may be surprised to learn that Cuba offers state-sponsored sex reassignment surgery free of charge. The policy has been in place since 2008 and represents the latest unexpected shift in government policy toward LGBT Cubans, considering the country's dark past when it comes to gay rights. See, in the years following the revolution, homosexual individuals were rounded up by the dozens without charges nor trial, physically and verbally assaulted, and forced to work in labor camps. It was a policy that continued well throughout the 60s and 70s and remains one of the most shameful legacies of the Castro government. But today, the unlikeliest of people has become the face of the gay rights movement in Cuba. Raul Castro's own daughter, Mariela Castro. Mariela is the director of the Cuban National Center for Sex Education, or CENESEX, and has pushed Cuban lawmakers to make the country more progressive when it comes to gender and sexual equality in a deeply Catholic region of the world. While in Havana, I had the chance to sit down with Castro to discuss the country's LGBT evolution and the issues that still plague Cuba's gay population. The biggest challenges are facing the LGBT community here in Cuba. The biggest challenges to achieve full rights for LGBTI people in Cuba are related to implementing policies through political legislation and taking concrete action that contribute to the transformation of Cuban mentalities. Our job is to succeed at transforming a set of minds and changing the homophobic culture that we inherited from our ancestors, our Spanish and African ancestors in particular, that dominated the Cuban culture. Mariela, the U.S. has claimed that Cuba actually imprisons people because they're gay. How do you respond to that? When the revolution succeeded in Cuba, the country inherited a Spanish social code that penalized expressions of homosexuality and transvestism. Between the end of the 70s and mid-80s, amongst other changes made to the country's legislation by the revolution, Cuba was able to eliminate from its penal code these forms of discrimination expressed by penalizing public behavior linked to homosexuality and transvestism. Although removing it from the penal code isn't enough, educational work needs to be done. Besides not being taken to jail, people still live in forms of social exclusion and discrimination in different areas of society. And according to our studies, particularly in the areas of families and employment. Mariela, considering the huge progress made toward transgender rights here in Cuba, why do you think it is that same-sex marriage is still not legal? The Cuban society and its process of revolutionary transformations managed to advance in many aspects and areas of discrimination. 
However, topics related to rights on sexual orientation and gender identity advanced much slower due to stronger prejudices and also due to scientific approaches that endorsed prejudice, which didn't help them to advance. To the extent that different sciences brought important elements to modify this way of thinking, social movements on an international scene, as well as the population in its own, identified the need to advance on these matters. We, as an institution, took upon ourselves the responsibility to bring this information to our people in order to reflect and grow. We were able to advance quicker on topics regarding transsexuality due to the fact that science still considered it a disease. Therefore, the population thought that they were ill and needed help. There's a sense of generalized justice, specifically in the health field. We have also been pushing the understanding that, first of all, homosexuality is not a disease, and that it hasn't been proven that transsexuality is a disease either. Moreover, that we can't think that all discomfort or ailments of people can be considered to be pathologies or diseases. Just from the fact that a person is suffering and in need of help, society must come up with a mechanism to treat it. That's why in 2007 we started organizing the Cuban summit against homophobia and transphobia. And since then, we have been able to witness that the population has begun to understand and accept these matters that we need to work on because they're all about social justice. And the Cuban people are very sensitive towards anything related to social justice. And how do you think the normalization of relations between Cuba and the U.S. will affect the LGBT community here? Independently from how the relations between Cuba and the U.S. have been thus far, the people from both countries have never stopped communicating. We are in touch with LGBTI organizations in the United States. Every year, groups from the U.S. come to participate in our activities, and we have also been there as part of very important exchanges. I believe that now that relations have been re-established and work is being done towards the elimination of the economic, financial and commercial embargo, we will have further opportunities to exchange and learn from not simply because the relations have been re-established, we can say that the U.S. population can visit Cuba freely, since that's still conditioned by the embargo. Thank you. It was a great honor to sit down with you. And thank you for watching. Be sure to follow me on Twitter at Abby Martin. Join me tomorrow when I break the set from Cuba all over again.